life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details, and survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello. 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 (laughs) And welcome to another episode of Sunday of the Dead. Today, uh, I am Lainey. Today. I was Marshall yesterday. And I think I'll be Marshall tomorrow, but never ever Marshall today. But what's your name? I do um, Corey. Cool. Yeah. You know, I just have to say, looking at Lainey's show notes, it seems like an eight-year-old kid named these first episodes of Walking Dead because we got guts, and now we have Tell It to the Frogs. And we are definitely going to talk about why it's called Tell It to the Frogs later on. But we're going to start at the beginning of the episode. And at the beginning, Merle is still handcuffed to the roof. And we are starting to see the effects of heat and dehydration as he going a little loopy. And he seems to be actually talking about time that he spent in the military. Yeah, he says he was in the stockade for 16 months And then all of a sudden he becomes like really coherent and he's like, he realizes that he's handcuffed to the roof and that the walkers are trying to get through the door. And then he starts to repent of his sins. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Let me, let me, let me just wipe my tears away for this, this, this wonderful man. Oh, wait, sorry. That's not what I'm saying. Um, He is very repentant. He's like, please forgive me. You know, I deserve this. Etc., which I think was kind of surprising for Merle that he realizes that he is kind of a jerk. There is future stuff that happens with Daryl. I won't even go into the details of it yet, but there's future stuff that kind of gives you an idea of at least what their relationship was. And if you extrapolate their relationship and how kind of difficult it was to what maybe their father was like. Yeah. Yeah, that's where you can kind of see this thing of him being repentant. Maybe Mm. he's, like, hallucinating, seeing his father. People like this do not come from good households, as a rule. They just don't. Right, yeah. So... And then, after he has done all this repenting, he sees that, oh, that's not actually going to save me. So, he's actually cursing God now. Mm -hmm. He's like... Oh, I never asked you for nothing before. I won't ask now. You can't get me to beg. And What stage of grief is this? Let's not get too carried away with what's happening there because we don't see what happens. Uh-huh. So let's go to the survivor camp. So the group is at the survivor camp. We pan there as people are driving in their big truck and that mm-hmm. Dodge Challenger. Uh, and uh, when the we're board. there, we have Shane and Lori and Carl and they're they're talking a little bit and Shane tells Carl that he's going to take him later on to go teach him how to catch frogs. Frogging. Yeah, to go how to go frogging and Lori does not like the idea of eating frog legs. Nope. And that kind of brings us to a, a really important point, folks, and that is that canned food does not last forever. Mm-mm. We we think canned food it lasts a long time. But there is a very definite shelf life. They are guaranteed to be good within two years of their manufacture. There's actually a record. Goya has said that their canned beans will last between three to five years. Mm -hmm. But... Botulism. Exactly. At that point, they, they can sometimes still be edible. But their nutritional quality degrades. They have a higher chance of having botulism. Uh, They might start to taste funky, and that will make it difficult to eat. Things to note, though, if you have canned food, and the can is swollen, dented, or rusted, you need to open it up and dump it on your compost pile. It is no longer edible. (laughs) No bueno. Okay? Keep your cans in a cold place if possible. So if you're like us, and you are staying in Satan's armpit... You basically are going to have to bury that Mm -hmm. in order to keep it cool. And then if you can't handle, like Lori, if you can't handle eating frog legs and hunting for your food, consider mushrooms. 
Again, those grow on compost piles. We've actually been doing some uh, research into how to grow mushrooms ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard if you can find some uh, store-bought mushrooms to start that up. All the research we found on the internet is trying to get you to buy a starter culture, but I've found a method that works with just the stems. Mm. It's sporific. Mm. Yeah, stay tuned. We might have more info on that later on this year if we ever go there. Mm Mm-hmm. So we have them coming back to the camp and Glenn is in a Dodge Challenger. The alarm is going off because Rick set it to go off in Atlanta so the zombies would follow them away from the store, but Glenn can't turn it off. So then he comes up, everyone's really angry because you know he's drawing the walkers to them maybe. So they finally get it to turn off and then the truck rolls up, everybody gets out and Amy is very happy because her sister's safe, etc., etc. But then Carl starts to cry. It's never really explained what it is that set him off, but I guess my theory is that he sees everyone reunited with his family and he's just sad because he has no dad. But hold up everything. Here comes Rick right around the corner and okay, so the the look on Lori's face It starts off with complete shock, then guilt because all of a sudden these forest rendezvous that she's been having with Shane are like flashing in her brain. And then she looks at Shane and is like, what the heck, dude? You told me he was dead. This is all playing out in her mind and you can tell. It's just boom, boom, boom. And Shane looks like somebody peed in his Cheerios. His eyes are starting off like, oh, oh crap. I'm screwed. Am I going to have to kill you now? Yeah. I saw that look going on in his head. Exactly. In fact, the only person in this scene that sees Rick and is happy to see him is Carl. True. Because Carl don't know. But if you look at everybody in the background, like Andrea and Morales, they're all looking at Rick like, what? Wait, you're, what? And what? (laughs) So it's a surprise to... (laughs) Those who didn't know. So then they have this reunion, and then the next thing you see, they're at this campfire, and they're eating dinner. You can see that Ed and Carol and Sophia are definitely separated from the rest of the group. Ed does not let Carol go fraternize with everybody else. Starting off his toxic masculinity right from the get-go. Also kind of a whiny baby about a Very whiny baby. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they're all talking, and Dale has some really good words of wisdom here. Yeah, he said, words can be meager things. Sometimes they fall short. Which, what do you guys think about that? Well, I mean, in the context, Rick is having a really hard time describing his experience. First, being in a coma, having the trippiness of the drugs in the coma when he wakes up, and then the world is completely gone, and he isn't sure if his family's there. Yeah, there's a lot going through his head. He doesn't have words for it. I think it's an interesting thing that can be taken even out of this context and that in my experience if you know somebody that's grieving don't just load them up with hallmark sentiments because they can't hear it and they don't want to hear it and it'll make them angry more than anything Mm -hmm. but sitting next to a person that's grieving is more than enough so that's kind of my approach to it and i think it You'll find that that there's a lot of people in here that will be that throughout the the run of the show is that Daryl especially he'll be that guy that just doesn't mm-hmm. doesn't use words a lot but not in a bad way that he he does through his actions he provides he takes care he's deeper than words but yeah. when he does use his words they are very on and mm-hmm. that's something that we're gonna talk about in a couple episodes too that his words actually have an effect on future seasons when we get there it's kind of really cool Mm -hmm. so then after the campfire everybody goes to bed yep and um husband and wife haven't seen each other in a while and there's some things that they like to do and poor shane is sitting on the outside of the tent and there's a little bit more that I, i noticed with this is that when rick comes up and he's a little afraid that he's going to wake up carl and Lori says oh don't worry he won't wake up this should have been a red flag Mm mm-hmm I get why he's still disoriented, but this is kind of a red flag because how does she know that in this teeny tiny tent, their kid won't wake up if she has sex? Because she and Shane have tested this. Yes. 
Carl would say something to his dad about Shane sleeping in the tent with the mom. He would say... He Not would, if he was asleep. Even if he didn't wake up, there would be more to tell. It just seems to me that... I don't know. I get what you're saying when where you're going with it, but I think that Carl would have a lot more to tell his dad if he was aware that something was going on. And I know I get, I get the logistics of what you're saying, but I just... I think Carl is oblivious... To, to any connection of them other than him being like Uncle Shane and taking right. him frogging. I oh yeah, he's think. definitely completely oblivious to this. But what I'm saying is like so, there has probably been some, probably one, there's been one night where Shane came in in the dead of night and they And did, then Shane leaves and... And after, the, and after that, that's why they started doing it in the woods because they didn't want to risk waking him up the next time. It's potentially, but it's definitely, like, theory. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So, I don't know. So after a good <laughs> night's sleep, <laughs> mm-hmm. Rick wakes up. He chats up the camp. He finds Carol, and Carol is cleaning and ironing Rick's clothes. Because that's just the type of person she is at this point. Mm-hmm. I find it really interesting, though, that she is like this, because she's kind of like... This is what she knows her purpose is. This is what she knows she can do and control is doing these things, these tasks. She knows she's not going to get smacked around by her husband for doing this. Would you say just now, since we're not going to go into it until later, but Carol has the most extreme arc of any of the people? I would definitely say that, yes. She, She has arced several times throughout mm-hmm. the story. Yeah, and I and I think that's only true just because of how low she was at this point that we'll get into in a second. You know, because Rick has definitely gone through a lot, so has Daryl have gone through a lot, but they weren't necessarily as low as Carol mm-hmm. was at mm-hmm. this point. I mean, Daryl and Carol are basically the only season one people left in this show. Right. So that... I, I think Daryl does have an interesting arc, but I think Carol definitely has an extreme arc because of how she bounces around different mm-hmm. ways. So after that happens, there's a commotion. We see that there's a walker eating a deer. And then we get introduced to Daryl, who Darryl. is so young. <laughs> yes. He's kind of like a less brash version of his brother. And what I found very funny is he comes out of the woods and he's got squirrels around his neck, right? Mm -hmm. That he's gotten. Now, if you remember later on, Daryl will take trophies from his walkers that he has killed by getting their ears and stringing them onto a rope, which is really funny because we used to have, I don't think we have it anymore. We we used to have a string of like soap ears, soap on a rope of these walker ears. But I think it's funny that he went from squirrels to ears. But that was kind of a nice detail that that was there. In the yeah, beginning. it's interesting as far as his behavior goes from this first time you see him to what we know as later. He's very like there's an immaturity about him. He's like, oh man, kind of thing. Like he's like that level, and he's actually got more energy, mm-hmm. or he exudes more energy than he does later on. If you right. watch him yeah. in, this, in season eleven, you'll see a very stoic. Like we said, he doesn't talk much. Yeah, um, exactly. Um, he's more closer to say like Clint Eastwood in one of the westerns or something like that. Very mm-hmm. taciturn. Don't doesn't talk much. So it is interesting to see he, he really acts kind of like a little brother in this. Mm-hmm. But, you know, because his brother's around, so he's still kind of got that mode. I'm not even if he's not in the camp right now, he's still you know in that mode. So he's very much more. Energetic. Yeah, he even goes so far as to like throw kind of a temper tantrum mm-hmm. when he finds out about Merle's. He's throwing squirrels at Rick. You know, like, why'd you leave my brother there? And yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so he's, I mean, he's pretty angry. But then uh, Rick finally decides that he's going to go back and get Merle. But not just Merle. He's going to go back and get the guns. And he's going to go back and get the walkie so that he can contact Morgan. Um, and that, we learn why it's so important is because the CB that they have in the camp is on a different frequency than those walkies. And they said that walkie talkies from the police station are on a unique bandwidth. If you have one of those, you can contact the CB, but the CB can't contact the walkie. Yeah. So that's kind of an interesting detail that they put in as well. And I'm also noting just how Lori is behaving here. 
And when you compare it with how Rick was talking about her in the first episode, how in the first episode she was like, you're not really here for us. Mm -hmm. And here he's like, I I'm thinking of going back for Merle. And she's like, are you asking or are you telling? And he's like, well, I'm asking. And then she's just pissed mm -hmm. because he's doing the right thing and not leaving a man to die. Mm -hmm. She doesn't care about when he's doing the right thing. She just wants him there with her. And mm -hmm. there's a degree I understand that. But she's very selfish still. And let's yeah. face it, the leaving a man to die thing is kind of Shane's department. Yeah. And then one thing I thought was also very interesting in this whole scene is that Carl is also upset that Rick is going to go. So he runs off to the tent. And when Lori goes in there, I looked at what was in the tent. There is a bottle of Tejava tea on this like makeshift table they have. And then also, if you look in the background, there's like a backpack or some kind of like something with a pocket. And there's a guidebook for Costa Rica. Are they using it as toilet paper? I don't know. <laughs> Good call. It I mean, may have been something like this may actually be the family tent. Right. Uh, like, I don't think that there's tents enough for everybody in this group to have been Dales. So some of them probably have tents of their own. Right. And this may have actually been their camping equipment. Yeah, but when you fold up a tent, you don't leave anything in it. So I don't buy that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, it would look like it was hanging out of a bag or a jacket pocket or something like that. And I'm just like, why? We're not in it, Costa Rica. It could also just be something like somebody grabbed at a store or something like right. that. Or reading perhaps material. before they, they were leaving, before all this happened, before Rick got shot, they were planning on taking a trip to Costa Rica because she doesn't feel that he's there for her. I don't know. Okay. You, can't, you can't see Marshall's head swiveling. <laughs> But it is. Maybe oh, you, no, you didn't. <laughs> Back to Atlanta, they decide to park the truck on the train tracks and walk the rest of the way through so they can get through the walkers a little bit easier. But that's all they do in the scene. So we're going to go back to the quarry. So Shane takes Carl down to the quarry to catch frog legs. Oh froggies. Well, um, catch frogs. First. Just the frogs with the legs attached, yes. And there are a bunch of ladies doing laundry. And here comes my favorite quote of this episode. Jackie says, I'm beginning to question the division of labor here. Can someone explain to me how the women wound up doing all the Hattie McDaniel work? So I had to look it up. Hattie McDaniel was the role of Mammy in Gone with the Wind. So that makes very much sense <laughs> as to what they're talking about. <laughs> Especially when Ed is sitting over in the truck just, like, smoking and chilling and doing nothing. And just as a point of personal trivia, what was your name supposed to be? Yes, my name was supposed to be Tara, that my parents were going to name me after the house plantation Gone in Gone with the Wind. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Wow, cancel culture would have been all over you for that one now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> much. So then the women are talking about all the things they're missing, their stove, their coffee maker, their vibrators, etc. So they're laughing very, very hard. And Ed gets all whiny again. What are you talking about over there? Why are you joking? Blah, blah, blah. So I have to make a little note here. I have always wondered why Carol's hair is short like that short and we don't really find out until season nine which way farther carol has long hair mm -hmm. as we all know it takes a long time for hair to grow out but why did she have short hair well it is revealed in season nine episode 10 henry reveals that carol had always kept her hair short due to her former husband ed's abusive nature which i think we can mean to say he would pull her hair yeah yeah and that uh, yeah, if you know how short her hair is, you can't get your fingers on that. So smart on her part, but very sad and a very interesting detail, especially explaining, you know, how violent Ed really is at this point. It also shows some burgeoning survival skills in her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that she will be able to, like, have to fruition later. That she was like, I'm going to survive this the best way I can and get through it. So Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So then uh, Lori comes down to get Carl away from Shane because she's just mad now that she realizes that Shane has lied to her and basically mm -hmm. manipulated her. And she says to him that he no longer has a say in things and he can tell it to the frogs, which is the name of the episode. Then says, you have to stay away from us. You, you can't. You don't have anything 
yeah. to do with this. Being she should have made the right decision way before this and not just hook up because it was convenient. Yeah. And granted, he's a friend of the family, so it's comfort, it's there, but she knew she was doing wrong because in the second episode, she takes off her wedding ring from her neck and like puts it to the side. Yeah. She knows deep down that, that something's not right about this. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that's tricky about Shane is, and we see this as the show goes on, that Shane ha- has the skills to definitely survive in this world. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rick has some, but technically speaking, Shane's stronger at this point than Rick. So he has his positives. Right. And he is looking out for people. It's not that he's not, but there's definitely something broken within him that oh, caused yeah. him to do the things he did. For sure. Mm hmm. So then Andrea goes to Ed and confronts him about the fact that he's doing nothing. And Ed throws a wet shirt at Andrea's face very hard. Yeah. So then the girls are trying to protect Carol from Ed. And then Ed ends up smacking Carol. And then Shane, who is already lit by this conversation that he's had with Lori, basically goes to take his frustrations out on Ed, A, and protect Carol, B. What do you guys think about... Shane's reaction, do you think it was merited or do you think it was way too much? Well, for a sheriff or any law enforcement officer, from what I've heard, the calls that they hate the most is domestic abuse calls Mm -hmm. because they're dealing with an aggressor, whether it be male or female, and someone who may have called but will back down Mm -hmm. out of fear Mm -hmm. uh, on things. So part of it, I think on a personal level for Shane is just I finally don't have any judge that's going to go after me on this and I can take out a a wife beater. I definitely agree with you at the point that he's letting his frustrations out. So I think if he had stopped earlier than he did like two or three punches in and he'd stopped that was one thing. But where it kept going is where you go okay yeah yeah, he's Mm -hmm. not there's one there's one thing about defending and then there's one when that defense becomes offensive then that's or offensive that that uh, yeah that's there's definitely a turning point in that and I actually there's a lot more going on here that I don't even think that Shane is thinking about and that is that Ed is a liability for the survival of the group mm, we have seen that right at the very beginning he does not care about anybody else but himself. So he will use up resources Mm -hmm. to make himself feel better in a way that is going to make it so zombies will come after them. He is willing to make noise by beating somebody up for his own ego. Mm -hmm. This is a guy that needs to be put in his place. And Shane does that for his own reasons, Mm -hmm. then takes it too far, But Ed is not going to cross him ever again. Ed is now going to listen to him. Yeah. And it's kind of funny, too, because in the scene, once Shane backs off from Ed a little bit, there's this moment where Shane and Andrea look at each other, and Andrea looks at Shane like, dang, you just did that. And I think that's funny to me because I I think in season two or three, I don't remember what season it is, they get to the farmhouse where Maggie lives. And I think they start hooking up at they that do. point. So I had this like thought of, is this where it starts? Where Andrea kind of looks at him like, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I can understand that not being a woman, but I can understand seeing somebody that protected another woman would be mm. a, a positive th- thing. But it's just thinking again about like when he's actually doing the violence it's like he had the anger in him but that violence ignited further anger it just set him Mm. off so it was like the literally physicality of him doing it just lit the fire of like an oil well and it just like right yeah yeah so after this fight we are back in atlanta and they get to the roof and they find out that merle is gone having used the hacksaw to take his hand off so that he can leave. Did he he left his hand there, right? Yep, he left his hand there. It's not yeah. like it's going to do him any good. No. I mean, what, if you were to have a clean cut, maybe you could reattach it if you got it back on soon. Mm-hmm. But that hacksaw, that thing is shredded. It's not going to get yeah, attached and again. without and without the proper facilities and yeah. sanitation. Mm-hmm. If I were doing that episode, I might have made the hand 
form a finger at the people that left it. <laughs> no, flip, I, I, like flip him off. Basically, it's like you yeah. left me. But mm. but uh, yeah, I mean that he would do that to them. But, For the yeah. end of this episode, there is no song. It's just instrumental music. So I really have no comment about that. And again, no one was killed in this episode. So I don't really have anything to talk about that. R.I.P. Merle's hand. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So let's talk about the comic book connection for this. It is page 49 through 95 of Still we're still in Volume 1. So here are some things that are the same and some things that are not the same. So the first thing is that Carl's t-shirt in the comics is the same as the show. It is the Science Dog t-shirt. Seance Dog. Seance dog? Seance. So the dog can speak with the dead. Okay. Uh, So yeah, it's the same t-shirt there. Number two, people introduced in the campsite that are not in the show are Alan, Donna, Billy, and Ben. Interesting. And Ed also does not exist in the comics because Sophia has this whole conversation with Carl in the comic about her dad coming back. So Ed does not exist. I guess they just made this to really push Carol in that direction and make that volatile scene, I think, was good. It works, yeah. Yeah. Dale warns Rick that Shane might be involved with Lori, and Rick doesn't believe him. Mm. So in the comics, there is that foreshadowing. Mm. He, he says to Rick, you need to watch out because Shane is, is kind of creeping in, <laughs> which I thought was very interesting also. And lastly, Rick and Glenn go back into Atlanta for a gun store. There are no dropped guns in the street that they go back for in Atlanta. They just go to a gun store and they pick up the guns and stock up. Yep. And that's all the differences in the comic versus today's episode. Also, one of the last things we want to bring up is the fact that Daryl is never in any of the Walking Dead comics. Which is funny because as if you are a big fan of Walking Dead, you know if Daryl dies, we riot. I don't know if that's so much true anymore, but for a long time it was like, do not kill off this character. So I guess we can really say that Carol is the only original, really, that survives in this entire thing. Yeah. From the entire universe. Mm -hmm. And that's our show for season one, episode three tell it to the frogs thank you for listening to sunday of the dead and exploring each episode with us if you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com we want to bring you new and exciting geek worthy content if you want to help please consider donating to our coffee account the link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. Yeah.